Thank you. Lord bless the children. And a wonderful teacher known as Miss Sheila Ebram with that handsome son she's got who's qualifying all over the state of Texas in trap and skeet shooting. Oh, my, 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 my. Where'd he learn it? Out at the ranch. It's, it's our pleasure in the truest sense of the word to be here, Patty and myself. Sunday morning after the message, a, a teenage girl, I don't know if she's here tonight, she gave me a, a card. The one side is prayer request. Then the other side is handwritten. I don't know if someone else did it. Or I asked her, and I'm pretty sure she said she had taken time to write this. Um, Sunday morning the, at the top it says reminder Jesus loves you hey father please bless the person who receives this prayer they may or may not be going through a rough time but just help them if they are show them the love they deserve amen that's how this church has treated Patty and myself. She's kind of a spokesperson for you, in my imagination. None of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through before he found the sheep that was lost. We have a wonderful Savior. And we have a wonderful soon coming king. Yes. Yes. And soon he's going to take over. And we're going to rule and reign with him. We have a wonderful Savior. Yes. We have a glorious Savior. And he has plans beyond our wildest expectation. I want to read a testimony, and it's a tribute to my pastor who was a contemporary with a people, men and women who came out of the great Azusa revival in Azusa, California, when God in His grace poured out the power of the Holy Ghost uh, in this nation. And um, my pastor was just a teenager and God called him to preach and he was educated to about, I don't know, the sixth grade. But he found out that if you do obey the Lord and you do step out, that God gives us exactly what we need when we need it. He would finish preaching, and his, his wife, whom we affectionately called Sister Van, she would say, Van, where did you learn those words? You were using words I've never heard you use. And, of course, we all know that it's not by might, and it's not by power but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. That we'll never do anything for His honor that He isn't there to carry us through. Now, my pastor then, as time went along, got um, fed up with organizations and started an association so that pastors and ministers and evangelists and missionaries could have an association where no one was dictating to them or owning their properties and so on and so forth it was called the IMA, the International Ministerial Association. My pastor loved pastors. He loved their wives. He loved uh, missionaries. And, and they came from all over the world because it became an international ministry. And so I'm saying that to say I saved something as he looked back through the years of his life and being a friend of Jesus and doing his best to follow Jesus. In fact, he said, I want my grave marker to say his agenda was my agenda. That's another way of saying his wishes are my wishes. His wants are my wants. Whatever he wants, I want. I really loved him. He was the first righteous man who had a backbone and stood up for things that you ought to stand up for. Uh, I remember when uh, he was saying that he was walking down the street and a fellow came out of a theater and he was smoking a cigarette and he said, oh, Brother Van, he said, uh, pray for me that I can throw these cigarettes, uh, quit these cigarettes. And he said, I won't, I won't pray for you for that. I'll pray God give you a backbone big enough, strong enough to throw them down in Jesus' name. <laughs> I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I'm trying to say he fought the good fight. 
he loved ministry and he started churches he supported churches now he wrote this and i want to use it as a tribute in my effort to always lift jesus up uh, when i minister because the promise is if i be lifted up i'll draw all men to me i'll do something that eloquence and handsomeness and buildings cannot do I apologize to whom or to all who have sat under my ministry. Well, what in the world has brought this on? Are you see now, Brother Van? Are you going off your rocker or what? In answer to your question, let me first explain why I want to apologize. For it's almost homegoing time for me, and I've been looking at our work done in winning souls, establishing churches and saints. What I see makes me tremble. I want to explain my trembling, at least some of it. I keep asking myself if I have preached the cross like I should have. Why did I allow others to mire me up in their personal views of Acts chapter 2, verse 4, Acts chapter 2, verse 38? Believing both scriptures with all my heart, I suddenly realized it was the cross that made both of them possible. Why didn't I keep the cross out in front where it belonged? Not doing so has made room for Dr. Dobson and his views on so-called Christian psychiatry. Saints by the millions are turning to, or thousands are turning to its principles instead of going to the cross as the saints of the ages had done. Had I preached the cross like I should have, made it the place it is, I want to emphasize, made it the place it is. Where men are made brand new and women are bra made brand new. Where a spiritual future unfolds. Where spiritual horizons rise. Where God and man meet. Many of them wouldn't be chasing Pentecostal rainbows where the pot of golden prosperity lies. I recall the early days of the Pentecostal outpouring, and I remember the purpose of our spiritual pursuits. We yearned and we hungered for more of the Spirit instead of what the Spirit offered as rewards. I apologize for not doing my part, for not doing all I could to keep the blood flowing from the old rugged cross and making it the heart of the gospel as Paul did. To Paul, the preaching of the cross was the power of God. Why then have we changed it to something else? The troubled church at Corinth is much like the spirit-filled church of today. Being so, I will take Paul's position. For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. That's looking back. And that's a good look. And I was blessed to have gray-haired mentorship in my life also because the charismatic movement and church growth were blossoming everywhere and the people young people were running off and starting churches without any wisdom and we still need the gray hair we still need to look back and say who started this what did the foundation what did they believe how did they live sister van said you know mike you could go out to uh, the barn behind our house and uh, you could find grooves in the soil of that barn where Van, she called him Van, where Van would go out there and meet with the Lord. He established a place in his life where he met with the Lord. And, and she, she said, Brother Mike, you know, we had a revival before you were, before you were saved in 1972. And um, I want to tell you what happened, and I want to share it with you tonight. She said, Van was out in that barn, and he was praying, and he was crying, and he was saying, God, why are you using Oral Roberts and William Branham and Amy Sample McPherson, why? and uh, passing me over? He said, don't pass me by of what you're doing in this generation. Right, right, right. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he established a place where he could meet with God, because that's the will of God. Whether you're a teenager, I was a 19 when Jesus saved me, and I began to hunger and thirst for more, higher horizons, and, and things I never thought.
thought were possible where I could tell another young person uh, to get off, how to get off the lifestyle that I got saved from. I could tell them that Jesus did it for me. I didn't have to be a theologian or a Bible scholar. You just go and you tell them what he's done for you. Well, that became an adventure, amen? Every day you've got some. I had friends uh, that I'd hung out with prior to my conversion and at our hangout place, you know, the hamburger joints. Uh, one night I, I said to them, I'd been saved and I was sharing Christ with them all the time. And uh, one, one fellow that had been a good friend, I said, uh, hey, how'd you like a ride home? He said, not with you. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing about Jesus, you know. Brother Van said, oh, Lord, don't pass me by. Whatever you're doing, I, I want it too. Now, I'm going to tell you something that is true on the basis of that everything the angel said to my pastor came to pass. After a prayer meeting where God touched his heart, he was walking down the street to go up the steps to this uh, second-story office where they had purchased two buildings to put together on North Main Street in Evansville, Indiana. And as he's walking up the steps, he heard footfalls behind him. And he turned around because it was at night and there was nobody there. So he continued walking up the steps and the footfalls behind him were hitting each step. He went behind his desk and he sat at his desk and there was a, a, a chair, a comfortable chair, um, sitting across from the desk. And he saw an indentation that someone had sat there, but the person who sat there, you couldn't see them. And so Brother Van said to whatever was sitting there, you're scaring me to death, show yourself. And he said there was a swirling movement of lights, and they got larger and larger and larger, and then boom. He said it was the most beautiful man I've ever seen in my life. And it was an angel from the Lord. It was an angel from the kingdom of heaven that had come with a message for my pastor he had said, I, I believe there's something more in life than preaching, which is good, and pastoring, which is good, but I want to see signs and wonders. I want to see the broken healed. I want to see the empty filled. I want to see families saved. I want to see this world turned upside down. I know there's more, and so I'm going to meet with you, and I, I want you to do for me what you did with people from Genesis to Revelation. When they met with you, that's where the tide turned. That's where the dream came. And so that angel told him numerous things, and I'm aware of many of them. Um, and they all came to pass. And I said that because the message tonight is about establishing a place where God can turn the tide in our lives and speak to us of things, remarkable things that he wants to do in us. But when he does something in us, he wants to do it through us so that others can receive the pardon, the passion, the purpose of the kingdom of God. And why was the cross so important? What dividends, what achievements did Jesus make available to us? Well, he made everything. Every promise of God is yes and amen in Jesus when people ask me how to overcome fear, I say it's a name, it's a name, and two words. They say, what in the world are you talking about? I said, number one, the name is Jesus. Whatever's troubling you, whatever is percolating in your heart and mind, whatever you can't shake, say Jesus to it. Because he opens every prison door. He breaks down every barrier. He lifts us up, and I said the two words are, thank you. Say that. Jesus, thank you. When hell's breaking loose, and you say, I don't know a promise. Well, you know the promised one. And in Jesus, every promise is true for you. Don't let the devil tell you. If you don't know all the scriptures, you can't overcome fear and anxiety and despair and depression. It's a name, and it's a person. Peace is a person. He's a, the great prophet said he's the prince of peace. So peace is a person. And also peace is a gift because Jesus said, I give unto you my peace. And so I look right at him and I say, honey, or I say, sir, if you'll believe Jesus is as powerful as he says he is, then there's no problem you have that he's not greater than it. Amen. There's no hurt that you have that he's not greater than it. 
There's no, there's no anxiety caused by particular circumstances that he's not greater. So receive it by saying thank you because that's what you say when you receive something. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that every promise in this Bible, it comes through you and it's yes to me. It's not yes sometimes and no sometimes. It's yes every time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. When I was first saved, God put into my mind a two-syllable word, and it was a name. And I battled and struggled with anxiety as a young man and um, couldn't find peace of mind. always felt I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Nothing. I loved uh, being with people, and uh, I had a good personality. But there was an emptiness in me that I felt like an outcast. I felt like an outsider. Everybody's having fun, but I don't fit in. And so when Jesus made himself real to me, the first step in my mental change was I breathed two syllables, Jesus. Now don't think I'm crazy. You can breathe Jesus. I found it difficult to fall asleep prior to conversion. I'd lay down in bed and breathe two syllables, Jesus, Jesus. Isaiah said, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You say, well, I can't say that all day. Well, there are some, you, you're going to think something all day. It doesn't mean you can't do your cooking or whatever you're doing, your work and your bike ride, whatever you're doing. But when, you see, I don't deny the feelings and thoughts that come to me. I direct them. If I get a feeling of despair, I direct it out of my mind and I direct into there my peace I have given unto you. So it's a battle every day, amen? Amen. But we overcome by the blood, by the redemption, by the gift of Jesus Christ. He's given us everything he is, and by the word of our testimony. In 2 Kings, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem. Now Elisha's an anointed man. Elisha is God's gift to that generation. And through Elisha are coming signs and wonders. There are miracles and healings. And more than that, people are able to look up again that there's more to this world than what we see or that surrounds us. There's a, there's a God in heaven and there's a purpose in life. And he's passing, it says here in verse 8, he went to Shunem where there was a notable woman. And she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know. That's the important thing about faith. We must know that it's Jesus wanting to get a hold of us. We must recognize it's Jesus knocking on our heart's door where we want to pray. That's Jesus. It couldn't be the devil. It's Jesus when we want to tell someone else about Christ. And that thought's coming day after day, time after time. And she said to her husband, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall. Let's let's do something. Let's expend some time and some talent and some treasure. Let's get some lumber. Let's measure it out. Let's secure it. Let's make it steady. Let's make it level. Let's balance it out. Let's let's do some work here, and let's build something on this house that this man can rest in when he comes by. If you're going to establish a time to meet with the Lord, it's going to take a decision. It's going to take some measuring out of time and some hammering it into your calendar and say, tomorrow morning at whatever time, I'm meeting with the Lord. I'm going to let him talk to me, and I want to talk to him first thing in the morning. And then we'll learn that it's a continual conversation all day. And then we'll learn at night like Jesus on the cross said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Every Hebrew boy and girl learned that when you go to bed at night, you say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. We say when I lay me down to sleep and that kind of thing, but into thy hands. We start the day praising him, looking to him, depending on him. We walk through the day depending on him. And at night, he's our last thought. I hope that you do that. It takes an effort. This man and this woman are going to make an effort that pays off. 
Let's make a small upper room on the wall. Let's build something. Let's put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes, he knows he's welcome here and he can rest here and he can turn in there. I'm having trouble not preaching all my notes yeah, yeah. while I'm reading the text. But they established a place, a meeting place. That dove came out of the ark three times. On the third time, it found a place to rest. And this is the same story again. The story of the Bible is told over and over and over again. God just wants a place where his promise can find a resting place. He's just looking for a teenager, a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old. He's looking for an 80-year-old that can be inspired by a fire on a bush. And if, if uh, that 80-year-old will let the word rest in him, uh, he'll let that word rest in him, and they'll tell him to go to Egypt and keep repeating it over and over. Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh, let my people go. There's greatness in all of us, but it's only shared with us when we create and build a meeting place. Oh, what an opportunity. Verse 11, and it happened one day. There's always something happening. I don't know what God's doing right now, but I know what he has done, and it makes me anticipate some exciting things every day for our lives. It happened one day that he came there, and he turned in to the upper room, and he lay down there. He rested there. He abode there. He stayed there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call, call this Shunammite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him. She's standing uh, in the room that she and her husband had built so that the anointing and the word of God and the dreams of God could find a place to rest. That's where she's going to hear what she's going to hear. She didn't uh, hear it at the movie house. She didn't hear it at the hamburger joint. Uh, will you, do you follow the thinking? Yeah, yeah. All that, that, none of that's wrong. But where did she hear it? That's important. And she heard it in the meeting place that she and her husband had made sure was secure, and it was there, and it was established. Call her. Verse 13, and he said to him, Say now to her, for us, with all this care, what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? I can give your husband a position of great power and authority. Is that what you want? She answered, or to the king or to the commander of the army, she answered, I dwell among my, my own people. I'm, I'm content. I have enough. But God doesn't believe she has enough, and he doesn't believe you have enough, or he doesn't believe I have enough. He wants to give us more. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, I'm not going to miss the right opportunity. God's not going to call you once. He's going to call you twice. He's not going to call you twice. He's going to call you three times. How long is he going to call? He's going to call until we recognize him. That's what he's like. He never gives up on us. He never gives out on us. So the, the prophecy, the prophet keeps coming by. Then they finally build a place. And then he, she's already called in uh, to meet him in this room that she has built with her husband. So in verse 14, so he said, what then is to be done for her? And God's answered, actually, she has no son. Her husband is old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Saint, that she stood in the doorway of that room, that meeting place that they had built. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. That came out of nowhere. Me? I, I can't have children. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. I've already processed the fact that I cannot have a child. I, I went into the cemetery in my soul, and I buried that dream. 
I buried that hope. I prayed and I prayed, but I couldn't have a child. Now, don't, don't stir me up because you appreciate that I made a place for you to rest and I prepared me. Don't say something to me unless it's from God because you're going to stir up emotions that I had to deal with and I, I got rid of them. But you're telling me that I can have what I couldn't have. So don't, don't lie to me. Don't you dare lie to me. Jesus said, if we listen to him and pay attention to what he says, and we, we write it down and we memorize it, he said, there's more that you're going to receive. And so she, she wrote it down that there was a man of God coming by, and, and he probably had Bible studies with her, and he, he, uh, he told her all about uh, Moses and the great patriarchs. Uh, but there was more that God wanted to do for her. And now God speaks to her through this man. That's what I believe, what I'm trusting in. And I've set myself apart for several weeks before coming here. Lord, let me have a word for people tonight on Tuesday night that on the 20th anniversary of this great church that you would speak something more into their spirit. They love their church. They support their church. They've built a place where the glory of God can visit. But Lord, you have more for Brother David and his wife and children. You have more for Pastor Jerry. You have more for the people in this church. Lord, I'm asking you to give me a word that I can speak to them. And some of them will say, but I buried that hope. I tried that. I wanted it so bad because I love Jesus and I have dreams and hopes, but it seems like I'm the wrong man. I'm the wrong woman. This is the wrong family. No, 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 don't say that. Build your place where he can meet with you and he'll speak something that'll take your breath away. And there she stands in the room that they had built for a meeting place and she hears God speak to this man. What you gave up on, you're going to have. <laughs> then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord. Verse 17, but the woman, she conceived because the word never returns void. And that word got inside of her in your soul and spirit where things of God are conceived and bore a son. Now, when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her, and the child grew, and now it happened one day that he went out to his father to the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. Uh, so he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, and then a dark moment, tragedy. Then he died. What God had given her died. And she went up. What'd she do? She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. She went to the meeting place that they had built. She went to the place to where she heard the Word of God, to where she found out the answer to three titanic questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? Uh, she sat in that room and listened to him teach about God and about God's great men and women from Genesis up to this time. It was there that she heard the Word of God. It was there that she was prayed for. It was there that she heard this man speak for God and say, God's going to give you a son. And so it's there that she laid her son because that became the place of her confidence. That became the place. It's the cross. That's the reason I started out with that. It's the cross. It's Jesus Christ. That's the answer for every struggle. And when things more terrible than we ever imagined happen to us, Jesus is still the answer. So go and lay your problems at the feet of Jesus or in the arms of Jesus, the good shepherd, because he's the only one that can raise it up again, but he'll give it back. If you had a word from God, there, it becomes a battleground 
And from Genesis all the way to our Lord Jesus, we were told that when God gives you something, it becomes a battleground. The devil wants to steal it. The world wants to steal it. Your flesh wants to give up on it, but you can't give up on it. And this woman is such an example of what to do. She simply went back to the place of her confidence, and she laid that boy down in the place where she had cried tears of prayer, uh, where she had shouted over Eli Elisha, did that really happen? Did God really do that? And I'll mention it again, when you have a good local church like this, this is the place, your meeting place, corporately, and you'll hear things. How many have heard something that changed your life? How many have heard something that you couldn't, you couldn't shake? You, you got in your car and you were saying, by golly, did he say what I thought he said? <laughs> was anybody else getting there? Because I felt like he was just talking to me. My pastor, had a, he had, you know, big old fat hand. He, he was a burly fella. He wasn't tall, but it looked like sausages on his hand. And he would point while he was preaching, and I'd be sitting over there. And I thought that finger was pointing at me, and I'm thinking, how can he point that way? And it points over here. <laughs> the boy died. Verse 21, and she went and laid him there. Verse 22, then she called to her husband and said, please, we need to come into agreement. Send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run run to the man of God and, and come back. So he said, why are you going to him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said three words of deep, deep conviction. It is well. You told me that God told Moses they're coming out, but there's going to be a fight. It's going to look like it's not going to work. And you told me that Moses went right back before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. You told me that when God gives you a word and it looks like it's not going to happen, you told me to get some backbone and stand up in the name of the Lord and keep speaking and saying, you cannot take from me what God has given me. I'm telling you, it's going to be a fight for you to have peace and joy, a sense of righteousness, but you can win. You can win by getting a hold of the Word of God until it becomes your Word and you keep speaking it. Amen. That's good preaching, Pastor Mike. I have other notes, but I have a firm conviction that I've said enough tonight to make the point that was put on my heart by the Lord Jesus. You see, I have a deep conviction that when pastor called me and invited me that it was the Lord inviting me through him. And I sanctified myself uh, for the time period between him calling me and coming here. How do I mean I sanctified myself? Well, I got a hold of myself spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And I set myself apart from Facebook, which I love to, to share on. You know, I, I share scripture all the time. But I sanctified myself away because it was a distraction because I had decided that I was going to meet with the Lord concerning this 20th anniversary. And that all day long I'd, I'd be listening. And I'd had a, I had a piece of paper with me. And if I don't have a piece of paper, I'd text Patty with what the Lord's saying to me. Because if you ask the Lord to talk to you, my God, honor him enough to expect that he's going to talk. And so that's where I heard the name Rachel. You know, while I was praying, I heard the name Rachel. And so I sanctified myself from television. Don't watch much, but at night, at the end of the day, you know, when you're just tired, you think, boy, some uh, microwave popcorn, put your feet up, you know. And, and uh, we watch Pure Flicks, and uh, it's corny and this and that, but it's safe. <laughs> Patty said, we're going to watch something tonight. And I didn't tell her the whole story, but I said, baby, I can't watch television. Every, everything but me being sanctified apart for Pastor Jerry, his wife, and this church, I need to be listening until I get there. And so I was taking notes and listening, and I sanctified myself from foods that caused me not to think as good as you can, you know, like them 12 donuts. <laughs> you, you think kind of fuzzy after you do that. And so it ain't no big deal, but I use the word sanctify because it's biblical. I set myself apart that I could hear from God and come here with something that would matter to at least one person. Yeah. 
One person that could hear that you went to the cemetery in your soul and you buried a dream because you didn't think God was going to let you have it. Or you thought you failed so bad that it couldn't happen in your life. I come here to tell you, meet with God. He probably has another word. Hey, Amen. He probably has something wonderful to say to you. And tonight I was convinced that what I, I had about building a place was the word. And that somebody or some bodies will say, you know, there's something stern inside of me that says, I got to do that. The, the possibilities are paramount. What would happen for me and my spouse or me and my children, me and the youth group, me and uh, whatever ministry group? What would happen if we, we build a place where every time we meet, we're saying, Lord, speak, we're listening. Lord, speak, we're listening. And then when we went home individually, that we had a place that was set up. And if you can get a certain time, that's great. Lord, speak to me. If you would stand with me for, Pastor, can I go? Okay. Come on, stand with me just a moment. I saw myself doing this in prayer. When I say I saw myself, doing it. I really do. I imagine it. And the Lord speaks to me, but I don't hear an audible voice. But the Lord will speak to you and your spirit and your soul and your body will respond as if you heard a voice. Amen. Can I say that again? That he'll speak to us and our spirit, soul, and body will respond as if we heard a voice. I'm going to read this that I, I wrote for this church group for this 20th anniversary celebration, for those who would be here Tuesday night. Lord, you've made us in your own image and likeness. Lord, you have placed within us desires which the world can never satisfy. Lord, you've placed within us desires the world can never satisfy to each teenager here. God's put in you a desire that nothing in this world could ever totally satisfy. And so you do reveal yourself to us day by day. Lord, you satisfy our hunger with bread from heaven and quench our thirst with water out of the river of God. We desire to live for your glory. We desire to understand the meaning of the gift of life <laughs> with which we have been blessed. You've entrusted us with solemn responsibilities. Enable us to understand their meaning and to respond with all our hearts to their demands. Lord, bless us tonight. May this house be the very gate of heaven where we recover our strength and have our souls restored and receive dreams again that go beyond our thinking. Comfort us. Give us consolation, Heavenly Father. May our worldly minds be given to know this, morning, this night that there is a world higher than this present one a cause and a purpose to lay our lives down for, to declare with all our heart, not my will, but thine be done. Sometimes there's a, a very strong now in our hearts that says, I have to do something right now. And it's the spirit of the Lord so often. I pray if anyone in this house tonight so, Pastor Mike, that word came right to my heart. And I believe God has come by so many times asking me to establish a place, a meeting place, to where that dove can rest, those promises can rest, the will of God can rest, the wants of God can rest, where I could hear from you. And then I would obey or believe, and I'd go and do things for your honor and glory. If it's one person... That's fine with me. It'll have made a difference. But if the Word of God 
came into you and you're excited about a now. I gotta, I gotta go buy the lumber now. I've got to get the nails now. I've got to get the furniture now. I'm gonna build a place. I'm gonna establish a place, a meeting place where the heart of God who longs for me can speak to me. I'd like for you to step out from where you are and come down the altar. We will not keep you along, but we do want to touch you in Jesus' name. Because something happens when we are touched in Jesus' name. The man who went to Jesus and met with Jesus, and had a meeting, and Jesus said, go on home, your son lives. And when he got home, he said, when did the tide turn? When did the spring spring? When did the winter cold melt? When did my son get better? It was when you met with Jesus. And tonight on this 20th anniversary, Tuesday night, you could look back and say it was that night when the tide turned and I built a place and I've never turned back and I've heard one grace after grace and one spiritual blessing after spiritual blessing and I, I've heard one gift heaped upon another. So if it's you, please come quickly. It's a now time and it will make a difference. You say, well, what will happen? All I know is that there's a change that takes place. And as those lepers walk towards the priest to tell them that they were healed, they were healed as they walked. And so as you drive home tonight or go home tonight, it, that tide could turn. Yes. So don't ever just trust in demonstrations of feelings. Trust the Word of God. If we ask anything according to His Word, we know that He hears us. And we have the petitions we desire to hear. Well, there are four. I think pastors same way with me. I'm moved by young people. It's, I didn't ask to just moved by people, but if you think I'm rude or pushy or I'm trying to get results, believe the best in me. These aren't the only folks here that God's knocking, has knocked, has come by repeatedly and invited you to establish a meeting place that no other plan can deter it. That no agenda coming up, and so that's more important this morning. These aren't the only ones that are called to come. Father, in Jesus' name, cause each one to be released tonight. And we'll redeem the time. We'll redeem the time. Okay, then we'll do this. I, I'm going to, you go ahead. In the name of Jesus. It's not emotions, brother and sister. It's God moving. It's God calling. It's God knocking at the door of your heart. Your heart beats so many times a day, it's, it's astronomical. It's stunning. But God knocks on the door of your heart more often than your heart beats. Hallelujah. Because only you can do certain things. Only you can change certain lives. Only you have an answer. It comes through you. It comes through you in the name of Jesus. Lord, put a now in these young people's hearts. A now that says, I'm going to go home and I'm going to build a place in my heart where Jesus can come and rest. Where the Word can rest. I'm going to be a Bible person. I'm going to be a person of memorizing and speaking this. Sit, hun, in Jesus' name. You, you are going to be a terror for the kingdom of God. There's a fight in you that I sensed when I stood behind you. Uh, you're going to be a terror for the Lord. You're going, to, you're going to stand up to people that have shamed you in the past. You're going to stand up to people who have seen what's wrong with you and not say, what's right with you you're going to say hey listen i'm not your punching bag i'm a child of the living god and he loves me and i've got a word for you jesus will save you jesus will save you in the name of jesus may i now come into you so strong so strong that you'll build a place that you'll build a place. You'll put it off no longer. Even if you don't know how, talk to your youth pastor, talk to your pastor, talk to somebody. Help me. Help me build a place. Thank you, Pastor Jerry. Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, for this.
this young man. Come on, give God praise in this house. Come on. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Almost finished. Almost finished. Jennifer, I can't leave here until we pray for you tonight. Um, so, since if you turn around toward my sister, uh, Dana, get close to her. Tony, come around here. I don't know who I can get close to, to Jennifer. Y'all know how much I love Mama Jeanette. And uh, I didn't want to, I don't want to pull Jennifer out, but Mama Jeanette, she's been with me and Jimmy for a long time. But Jennifer, I'm just connecting with. Y'all look at me now, or y'all not going to know what I'm talking about. Y'all just got your head down, and y'all already in. Uh, Jennifer's brother passed away a couple of days ago, which is Jeanette's grandson. I've just met Jennifer over the last year or so as she begins to take care. And I've been over to Jeanette's home, and I watched her care for her mom. Now, Jennifer, there are questions in your mind about your brother. And... Uh, because of the way he chose to leave this planet, I, I, there are no pastors going to answer that for you. And we serve a God of mercy. And so we're going to leave that in his hands. And, uh, you know, we don't know where Sean's mind was, but I'm going to tell you this. God brought you here not to just take care of Jeanette. He brought you here because he wants to take care of you. And uh, you're not all touchy-feely and all that. But we're going to hug you tonight. And we want you to know this church loves you, and it's your house, and it's your family. And uh, we're going to do the, the, the service on Saturday, and we're going to do the best we can to honor him and honor you and your grandma, all right? Whatever family show up, we'll be nice to them too, all right? Father, I thank you for my thank sister. You. Thank you. She's my little sister. You brought her in this house, and you gave her a family. She thought she was coming to help grandma. God, she met her family. And she's coming in more contact with you. Matter of fact, I'm not saying she didn't know you. What I'm saying is she's getting to know you. It's so much different. She's going into a deeper level. And God, this is going to pull her into a place where her shoulders have gotten larger. And she's going to recognize when she sees the fake and the counterfeit. And she's going to pick up on the real real quick. And she's going to be able to help others and minister to others. She'll find herself praying for people. She'll think, where did that come from? So I speak into her life, and I ask you, God, to give her that boldness. Give her the spirit of, of, of love, God, when it looks like there's hate in the room. We bless her right now in Jesus' name. God, comfort my sister Jeanette, my, my mama. Lord, she's a spiritual mama like so many in this house to so many others. Bless her. Give her strength through this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very quickly, can we take a quick offering? When I say quick, I mean for the servant leaders to move very quickly. For you to grab an offering envelope real quickly. For you to grab your phone and go to holywild.net real quickly. And this is what I want you to do. We talked about at the beginning of the service that what moves the hand of God? One word. What was it? What was the one word that moves the hand of God? Say it again. Sacrifice. It's sacrifice. So tonight I'd like for you to sacrifice in your giving for uh, Brother David and Pastor Mike. I know we're a small crowd tonight, but for some of us, yeah, it's been a while since we've sacrificed. Yeah, we've given a tithe on Sunday when we're here and uh, other times, but to sacrifice would be a powerful thing tonight. Then we're going to go back, we're going to fellowship, we're going to eat, we're going to laugh, we're going to enjoy some time together, and we're going to get out of this cold sanctuary. All the women said, I mean, this man's saying amen too. My nose is cold. My nose is cold. I wanted to look back. Huh? Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to get done with this here. So everybody got to offer an envelope. You're making out your checks. I'm giving you a little time to make it out. Amen. If you don't have it, bring it tomorrow night. We'll be gathering at 7 o'clock out at the ranch. I got phone calls today from people I ain't talked to in years. Said they're going to be there tomorrow. We'll see what happens. I get them phone calls all the time. I'm coming to your church. Yeah, okay. You show up. I don't know you here. Amen. 
Amen. Father, we thank for an opportunity to be a blessing in giving. We thank you, God, to use this church and this community to be a blessing to those around us. We are light on a hill. We're not hidden. God, I thank you for this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead, guys. Pass the buckets. As the bucket passes.